as we're all aware, um, the healthcare industry is a com complex one um, with no shortage of problems, okay, in need of solutions. Um, the panellists you see in front of you here today and the guys here um, have already taken the time upon themselves to pursue those answers needed the most. And as you can see from the presentations they give, it's truly exciting, okay? So. Just to let's put this into perspective and really frame this up. All of the gentlemen sitting here are practicing physicians, 60, 70, 100 hour work weeks. On top of that, they wear other hats as directors in their departments, across their institutions, they're professors, they do research, they're entrepreneurs. On top of all that, which is an insane amount of workload and things to be taken care of, they're pursuing those answers to those questions that are some of the most difficult we're facing in healthcare today. So with that being said, perhaps each of you could share maybe two or three things that motivate you to take on all the things that you do. And perhaps you can share maybe how much coffee you have to drink to have the energy to do all these things. We can start with you, Dr. Hashimoto. Um, yeah. Um... I think this bigger question that we've been trying to solve in our lab about this democratization of surgical knowledge um, really goes back to family. My, my family's actually originally from South America, um, from Peru, and my grandmother needed her, it's a very simple operation, it's a cholecystectomy all by removal uh, done in Lima, and there are fantastic surgeons out there. But it's one of these things that I thought, well, but wouldn't it be great if I could bring her to MGH? Or maybe I could send like one of our hepatobiliary guys down to Lima. That's not realistic, right? And even if I could do that, yeah, I can do that, but not everybody in the world can do that. And so how do you take that type of knowledge that's at MGH, or University of Minnesota, or any of these places, UCSD, Mayo, whatever, and, and make that type of knowledge accessible to everybody? And so that's really sort of ultimately what gets me to wake up in the morning and, and go into a lab instead of necessarily going to the operating room. And uh, in terms of coffee, I have two before I ever leave the door. Uh, and then my third, usually by like 9 a.m., depending on when I got out of my first case. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Dr. Hutchins? Um, I kind of touched on it earlier. So for me, it's the passion for opiate reduction has been a uh, personal experience. So as my growing up with a father who's an opiate addict and then getting into this field, you could see how that impacted our lives retrospectively and then now strangely right <clears throat> that's how life is doing this and speaking around the world uh, about opiate reduction <clears throat> sorry my younger brother uh, had a back injury got opiates from his physician this was two years ago within the last year has been on heroin um, and trying to get into rehab so you see that right this touches everyone's family and it's if you don't have a family member or a friend you know someone who does, and it's uh, something that really is, is, is easy to be passionate and work hard for because this is something that's throughout society, rich, poor, uh, whatever race, ethnicity, background you have, this is something that is really impacting them all. And one coffee, bulletproof coffee every morning. <laughs> Which is like five coffees, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think for me, I mean, honestly, it, it, um, it, it's a genuine interest, right? Um, you don't, you don't want to admit it, but you, you sort of geek out to this, right? I mean, this is, to me, really cool stuff, and I can put my uh, family to sleep. My mom, she'll ask me, how are things, and 30 seconds into it, she'll say, I really didn't want to know anything other than good, right? <laughs> Um, so I, and I get it. It's not, it's not something that will be terribly interesting to, to everyone, but it's something that I, I really enjoy. I mean, at a, at a very like base level, I, I really get excited about getting up and seeing patients and, um, uh, doing some of the even basic surgeries that we do. I mean, ask someone, it's very gratifying to fix someone's hernia or take their appendix out when they're sick and they wake up and they feel better. That's hard to not have a lot of like, yeah, I can go an extra few more hours with that kind of secondary gain there. And then you get into some of the more interesting things that you do with a fetal surgery. Is it's uh, it's unique, it's it's demanding, but you get to work with an amazing group of people at the same time and see that contribution. And the research part, that's selfish. That's really for me. I mean, that really is something that um, I can spend all day uh, doing. And with the group of people that we get to work with, I, I just don't get tired of it. I really enjoy it. I think the the one thing to remember is the. How do we take it beyond what is a personal interest in your personal story? And how do you actually, because you, we're stewards of, of 
tax dollars and, and not-for-profit you know, structures and things like that. It really belongs to the people out there in the community. And how do we take this love and this interest, the secondary gain, and actually move the ball forward? And I think that's the part I, I probably, um, I, I think, uh, struggle with the most because you, you have to be honest about it. Are you really doing this for you or are you, are you actually making an honest contribution broadly? Um, I grew up in Seattle, and so there's never a time in the day where you can't uh, have coffee. It's just 24-7. <laughs> oh. uh, well, I have to agree with you. I mean, it, it's a passion. Um, we're all problem solvers, really. And so, and so when we identify an issue that we can tackle or want a challenge to tackle, uh, that's really sort of the passion behind most of this. Uh, you know, for me, it's... You know, can I get the right information to the right provider, whether it's myself or one of my colleagues, so that they can make the right decision faster than they could before? Uh, and making data sort of transparent. Um, and so that's, you know, that's the passion. Um, and, you know, for most of us that's, that are on EMRs now, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's actually a good tool to use. And um, it's, it's interesting because you're constantly changing the culture and you're always challenging your colleagues on that culture change and you know you have your early adopters and you have your laggers and you sort of have to mine both of those fields yeah well i know i speak for all of us when and, and you gentlemen as well uh the work that you do is amazing and and we're really excited to learn a little bit more detail about how the work you're doing is is disrupting healthcare. so without further ado so yeah, gentlemen, we tried to assign 10 minutes to each of you and we'll go through the panel. And obviously we want you to get some beer so we won't hold you up too much. Um, if you see Alex aggressively rubbing her ear or nose, it's probably because she's trying to give me a sign to move on, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Hashimoto, we'd love to start with you. So as I was telling you previously, Worrell have been taking part in research, um, looking at the peripheral, um, lung lesions and how we can get to those using robotics and AI. So for me, I'm really excited to talk about you. Um, and I know there's a few team members in here. Once they saw that presentation, their eyes lit up. Um, so taking it back slightly, and for me, I feel, you know, the future is robotics and AI, AI and I'm sure you agree. Taking it back, what was the point where you really saw the potential for AI to really impact healthcare? Where did the penny drop? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think it really started to come out when it actually wasn't something that I saw happen in healthcare. It's sort of like the slow transformation that you see in a lot of other fields. And I think this is, this is why it's important to have multidisciplinary collaboration, is um, I remember being at MIT and hearing the different graduate students give their talks about different topics, understanding or, or identifying certain structures, identifying decisions, analyzing decisions in driving and flying and drones, in security. Actually, this, the work being done in AI and security is really interesting. And then seeing common themes emerge across all these disciplines and sitting there thinking, why is healthcare being left out of this research field? And then trying to think about, well, if all of these advances are being done in all these other fields, we should try to tap into these brilliant minds and say, hey, listen, we have these exact same problems in healthcare. And can we try to do a little bit of collaboration here to translate these findings into healthcare? And I think it was when I saw it applying across different fields, that's when I was like, all right, it's time. We're used to being behind in healthcare, but for once, I think it's, it's nice to try to push healthcare ahead. Okay. And you mentioned then some other technologies. Can you try and get the room excited about you know, some emerging technologies that you may know of that we probably don't? that you can see impact in healthcare as well. Yeah, so I think um, you may have seen it on, on YouTube or on the news about generative adversarial networks and what they're doing. So these are two neural networks that compete against each other, and that's how they've been generating deep fakes. So these neural networks that can create, uh, actually they've done very good examples of an actor. So if we were to videotape you, and then we gave a neural network a picture of uh, you know, uh, Tom Cruise. Like you could act out exactly whatever you wanted to say and the, the neural network would create Tom Cruise realistically saying whatever you said or moving your head however you wanted. And so while that's a scary thing to think about, people actually the initial paper was done with that with Barack Obama and Donald Trump um, in terms of like having them sort of do fake things. But there's a couple of groups now looking into it as, okay, well, there are very rare anatomic scenarios that come up that we don't have enough examples of sort of, you know, replaced right hepatic artery or certain types of anatomy and say, well, 
can you teach a neural network to generate examples of this realistically so that now we can train other algorithms to learn on fake but realistic data that was generated by artificial intelligence? So I think that's a really cool area that's really in development right now. Good. It's incredible. And, and I'm probably, you know, I always aim for saying robotics and AI is a future and we talk about how amazing it is and some of these, you know, emerging technologies. Um, what are the negative aspects of lever leveraging, you know, this technology into healthcare? Yeah, so I think one is, uh, uh, I think the question came up, trust. How do you get clinicians to trust these systems? And how much trust do they need to have? And, and what kind of data do you need to demonstrate trust? I think one interesting challenge is really thinking about um, a topic that we touched on briefly. Are all decisions the same no matter where you are in the world? MIT did a phenomenal experiment called the Moral Machine where they created a website that forced two million users around the world to make a decision. This autonomous car is going to get into an accident and it's going to kill somebody. Mm -hmm. And now you have to go through a series of decisions and you decide who dies and who lives. And it was young person, old person, pregnant woman or child, dog or person, uh, rich person, poor person, uh, obese person, skinny person. And they had two million people and they analyzed this and you would have thought that there would have been some sort of underlying common morality that we all subscribe to. And what they actually found, there are three different cultures that broke out, a Western culture, an Eastern culture, and a Southern culture. And depending on where in the world you were, different decisions were made. And so that was done for self-driving cars. So all of a sudden car drivers were like, uh, uh, car companies were like, oh no, we can't just build one self-driving car. We now have to build three. So now the question is, in medicine, do we have a common set of values that we can all rely on where one algorithm is really going to be it? Or do we have to do a similar study in medicine and realize, well, it's a little bit different in North America versus South America versus Japan and China versus you know, Europe or any of these number of places. And I think that's actually a question that we haven't really even thought about and is sort of so critical, particularly when you think about some of the decisions that have to be made in healthcare. What's your hunch? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think it's, I think it's really gonna come down to culture. I mean, even in North America, right, the Canadians, we talked about earlier in the other panel, the Canadians have a totally different healthcare system than the US. So you can't just say, well, we're gonna have one set of decisions in North America. You're gonna have one set of decisions across Northern Europe and North America. I think you're gonna to start to find that decisions are gonna be a little bit different, even in country, maybe even parts of the country, right? Uh, Mississippi, Arkansas may have a different one than Massachusetts and New York, than California. Um, so it's gonna be really interesting to see how that shakes out. And with all this amazing technology, um, it can be seen as complicated by these surgeons and some of these surgeons are more classically trained. Um, a researcher was telling me that he saw the surgeon really struggling with this new Xbox controller to operate this catheter. Mm -hmm. And he said a seven-year-old could do it better. Yeah. So how do you see the future of these surgeons keeping up with this, or is it a different person taking on these roles? Yeah, so I think it's gonna be, uh, I think number one, there needs to be a lot of what you guys do, which is sort of thinking about the end user um, and realizing that when these technologies come out, there's gonna be a whole span of different generations of surgeons using it. You know, we, my father's 64 and he's still operating, I'm operating in my 30s, but yet we have a totally different conceptualization of using some of these devices. Um, and so understanding what it means to build for somebody like that, maybe you have to swap out a different controller, right? Like there are phones for <laughs> more elderly users, uh, and then, yeah, jitterbug, uh, and then there are phones for, for uh, younger people. You know, when my dad called me about setting up his iPhone, I was like, you know, why don't you call my, my brother 16? I was like, you know, if you just ask, uh, you know, Eric to do it, he can do everything for you. And sure enough, that's what he had to do. But that's not a realistic thing to do in an operating room. So how do you design something in such a way to say, well, okay, well maybe this particular user profile is a little bit different, so they need a slightly different control system. Or they need a different display to give them the information that they want. Or don't use it at all, right? Like maybe somebody who's that far along in their career doesn't need an algorithm to provide a little bit of extra support. And maybe it's a little more applicable to somebody that's just starting out in their career or it's using a, a, or trying a newer type of uh, technique or technology. So I think there needs to be a little bit of flexibility still in the system. I think it's, we have to move beyond the, here's the device, take it. I think I was talking to somebody in your human factors group that was like, we can no longer just say, here's your device, use it. And if you screw it up, well, it's your fault. You know, it's really on us to, to design around individuals. So thank you for teaching me something. I, I learned something today too, so. Uh, and finally, how do you balance that? So obviously, different technology, they're trying to keep up. How do you balance in a work, workflow efficiency? If there's a traditional equipment, there's modern equipment all in one operating room, is there a strategy behind that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think some of that has to be trying to, re it's, it's really about reducing cognitive load. You know, NASA has done a lot of studies on, on thinking about like your, your, your trans transfer load index and thinking about when, when you're jumping from one technology to another, um, you have to slow down a little bit or else you make mistakes um, until you, you build up a su sufficient amount of rep uh, reps. One is an educational component, so ensuring that surgeons are appropriately trained to be able to integrate multiple devices or um, trying to build in some part of the workflow where maybe a device is designed not for the primary surgeon to be using, but for the assistant to use. And so you're splitting the cognitive load um, appropriately. And so trying to think of creative ways around that is, I think is gonna be key. Yeah, definitely. Um, amazing feedback, yeah. I'm sure I'll, I'll pick your brain outside as well, but thank you so much. Thank you. I want to know what you do if AI did take over your job, just as a fun fact. Uh, if I get to cash the checks, then I guess I'm going on vacation. Yeah, but, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I think, uh, I, think for, I think one of the things is that I don't think it'll ever fully take over the job, right? Because it, that, it's that human component. I think you're still going to need... How do you interpret the data? How do you interpret... It? Do you really want to hear like a screen read it across or some... So do you want Alexa to be like, you have cancer? Um, I Probably not, right? And so I think at the very least, I can at least still be the messenger so I can try to build a relationship with the patient. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hashimoto. Uh, Dr. Hutchins, before we get into your questions, I just, I want to applaud you for your transparency and telling a little bit about why you're passionate about the work that you do. I think, um, for me at least, sometimes it can be a little scary or intimidating to talk with physicians and I think to just, share that open and honest perspective, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. So thank you for doing that. Um, it seems that uh, you've talked a little bit about why you initially became interested in, in pain reduction. When did you first become interested uh, in, in looking at a multimodal approach to, to um, solve some of the problems that you see? So I think it was just from the, from the get-go. So I did a cardiac fellowship, learned pain control just because I knew these patients uh, had really poor pain control in the ICU. And then when I brought it into our system, it was pretty impressive how fast the other surgeons were like, hey, come do that for our cases. Come do that for our cases. And as a fellow in cardiac anesthesia, it was like, sure. So I'd come in in, in between cases or when we were on pump or coming in at the, you know, at the end of my shift at night to do these things and to see, right, I mean, Anesthesia and surgeons make fun of each other a lot, but like to see surgeons that excited at our institution where we did nothing, and they're calling me a fellow, where, right, it was pretty impressive to see, okay, this made an impact. If they're that excited about it, I had surgeons would come in early, say, I want you to do this for my patients. And I'd be like, well, I'm working at this hospital today. Well, if, if, if I come in and start surgery at six, can you come in at 5.30 and do this? And then we, then we can start at six. I'm like, sure. I'm thinking like, what surgeon would come in an hour and a half early just to be able to get this injection so I can go to my other job and do my shift? Like that shows the impact. And so once I started to see that, it was like, no, we gotta do something else. Like we need to expand this and grow this in our institution. And then it was, what other ways could we do this? Because this is one aspect of these injections, but if we add this and add this and add this, do we get better outcomes? Because the data out there is not great. Um, and, and you started to see these impacts and then you start to patients and you have that connection. It's very easy in anesthesia to just be like, hi, how's it going? I'm Jake, I'm your anesthesiologist doctor, put you to sleep. It's like, now I don't have to talk to you for the rest of the case. Wake you up, put your recovery room and ship you out the door. Most of our life, I don't have a connection with the patient because I see them for two minutes beforehand, one minute before they leave and that's it. But to see that outcome and see them afterwards and see, you know, like, this was so much better than before, or this was this outcome, or this was this, it was like, right, you kind of get that gratification, right? It's somewhat selfish. It's like, I feel really good about this. Let's continue this and do this to everyone else. Yeah. Something that you talked about a little bit um, in your initial presentation was kind of the history and, and the things that were happening in the 90s and early 2000s that got us to where we are today with the opioid problem. I would love if, I mean, so I, I researched this a little bit in preparing for this panel and was pretty blown away by, by some of these things that were in place. And my perception or takeaway was that physicians' hands became a little bit tied in, in that time based on the regulations um, and the different things that were happening. Perhaps you could explain that a little bit more and what was exactly happening at that time. And then what was the perception or feeling of physicians in that climate and in that moment um, being asked to do some of the things that they were? 
Yeah, so as I kind of touched on earlier, in the 90s was when pain became the fifth vital sign. And that's when we really started to think, well, pain has, is negative for patients. Um, because before, we just thought pain's good. If our patients don't have any pain, and I still work with surgeons that think this, if they don't have any pain, then they're going to go and like lift weights and r run a marathon. And, and I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> like, this is not that good of pain control. Um, but it was this thing that we need to control their pain. And so it, everyone got pushed down from administration, from the federal government. And this came right in that kind of decade when the EMRs came in as well. So not only were these physicians who weren't pain specialists being told, control your patient's pain, they also had to figure out how to use a computer. And in the 2000s, most physicians had never used a computer before. Um, and so they're learning how to use a computer to chart their records, to make their orders, and now they gotta control pain. And it was too much to ask of anyone. And so it was very easy to set it all up with opiates and give it to opiates because now their patients didn't complain, they didn't hear about it, administration was off their back, and they went through it. Mm -hmm. But you saw a lot of physicians, and you see this today, even in today, um, you get pushed down, or you get pushed things from government or administration, right? And I'm an administrator, so probably just as, as uh, at fault for this, to physicians, and they're told to do things. And many a times you just do it because you're overworked, you don't have time to fight, you got a thousand other charts, patients, surgeries, whatever you have to do. Uh, but physicians do have a lot of power, and it's getting physicians to understand that if things are being told of you that you don't feel are right, to be able to work with administration and talk to them and say, hey, there's something wrong with this. Because if you don't say that, they think what they're telling you is what should be done. And, right, and, and I don't think a lot of people did that. Most just said, you know, all right, it's another thing on the books, I'm not gonna care. Even though they felt that I probably shouldn't be doing this. But you had, right, there's conflicting messages. You had the Surgeon General saying, opiates aren't addictive. Like, well, I, I, I suppose they're not. You had pharmaceutical companies pushing, 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 give this, give this, give this. Uh, and, and it wasn't until later where it was like, wait, we probably shouldn't be giving all this stuff, but I'm supposed to, I don't want our scores to go bad. Mm -hmm. And there was, right, there's that conflicting thing in, in the systems, and, it, and it's really trying to get physicians to really remember, patients first, what, what am I here for, and if I don't feel like this doesn't pass my gut check, mm -hmm. to step up and say, hey, let's have a conversation. And I think uh, administrators respect people that do that. If you don't do it, you, they don't always know they're wrong. A lot of them are non-clinical, um, and they don't understand that th the harm that this can have. Yeah. have. And in, in uh, going to the point you made earlier about the pendulum swinging really heavily to both sides, it seems that in 2017, 2018, currently, that pendulum is, is really heavily swung to physicians clean this up, clean up this problem. And it seems like an immense burden is placed on your shoulders to, to take this on and, and bring solution, which you're doing. Thank you. Uh, but with that being said, I'm curious to know what your perspective is on just on having to kind of carry that load. And also, who is really working, who or what organizations perhaps, are really working to support you as a clinician in making those efforts? And who do you wish to see step up a little bit more to help carry some of, of that load and burden? Yeah, so I, th I think it's who needs to is the entirety of the healthcare system. It's, it's uh, federal government, uh, organizations, right? JCO, uh, right? They're the ones that, you know, re regulate these hospitals. So if you're not JCO, then you know, you, they get in trouble. Well, if Jayco says you have to have an opiate-free pathway, you have to have this, these multimodal analgies of things in place, people will do it. But if they don't force them to, if they aren't regulated to do this, it's really easy to say, well, we'll eventually get to it, or we'll kind of do some things. Mm -hmm. um, for, but it's, you know, you need that type of a uh, pushback on them, but you need the education, you need the, the kind of the treatment aspects of things for these patients, uh, support from the government for that, but you need uh, patient education, patient advocates. We need to be talking to patients and listing them. It's very easy for us all to sit up here and say, this is what we think we should do. Uh, like how many people go and say, hey, patients, what do you think we should do? It, we, the hospitals do that all the time, like this is the best thing for patients, and then they do it and it's horribly wrong because they never talk to a single patient. Um, so getting all aspects, getting the payers involved, right? Getting these major payer systems to, to right, right, incentivize opiate reduction and 
these types of systems in the system. So I think you need everything on board uh, and not just put it on the doctors because they don't have the time, they don't have the, uh, the knowledge. Right? It's, it's, we're not there yet, and it's too much. I think we need the, kind of a whole system change, which right, it, we needed that in a lot of areas in, in the, the U.S. medical Certainly. system. Certainly. Just as a final question to you, just everything that you described, it seems like oral service design team uh, would be really well equipped to handle or, or at least contribute to understanding all those different perspectives and kind of putting that out into paper, finding a maybe common thread. Who do you suggest or think that we're all should, should take on as clients or try to sell projects to to help you know, bring that solution to life uh, and, and alleviate some of the burden on you? Tricky, I know, yeah, yeah sorry, yeah. off script. No, no, I, I, it's good. It's it's right. It's it's partnering with with healthcare systems, major healthcare systems that are really attacking this. And, and a really good one is uh, they're used for a lot of different things because of how they run things. But uh, IMH out in Utah, like the way they've attacked this, their CEO said, opiate reduction is my goal. And you go into an Intermountain healthcare system, and it's like their elevators have posters top to bottom about opiate statistics. They have a mm. a pillbox chandelier walking into the Park City. Uh, system and it's it's everywhere and so like partnering with healthcare systems that are focused on this I think will help them kind of learn how to navigate this but right you could partner with with the payers as well because right, they should be motivated for this because this is not only is this bad for patients but this is a burden on the healthcare system from a financial aspect of things these patients are the ones coming in through the ER coming in back and forth back and forth I mean we have it all the time and I, I get phone calls all the time when I'm on pain call this patient's in here, they get transferred here, they want more opiates, we don't know what to do. Is there anything wrong with them? No. Then say no. Okay. <laughs> what? Serious? What, 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 should we discharge them? Is there anything wrong with them? No. Then yes, don't just leave them in the hospital because they want pain meds, right? And, but it's, it's a burden to the system. So I think you have a lot of, lot of avenues of people to partner with that are starting to become invested in this and as the state government start to push this on physicians, they need to come up with, with some sort of a, a plan. I've worked with, I'm working with ICSI and this consortium in the state of Minnesota on, on this, and we see we develop these plans. And I was just talking to my uh, chairman today, I'm like, we got these great plans, and all our health hospital system did was send out an email to the doctor to say, don't prescribe more than this. Mm -hmm. There was no plan on how to do it, education of physicians, what do you, what do, you do for the patients that need it? How do you adjust or how do you determine this? So having someone come in and really help that, kind of work with that end user in that would be very helpful in, in a lot of different ways. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Colleen, so when we were researching you, what we found really interesting is how you manage all these huge, vast data points and somehow process them into actions within your department and your institution, which we saw today. Um, What's the larger picture? What's, what's really driving this? And what's the, the dream of all this? So how will it affect a lot of the audience in front of you today? How will, will all this data really, really affect them? Well, I mean, for the most part, it's providing that, that extra clinical decision support for the providers. It's unloading that cognitive load that they have to do. A lot of these um, older patients that are coming in are, are very complex. Um, some have active cancer, some have two or three comorbid diseases going on at the same time. And so, you know, that cognitive load makes the complexity quite high. The idea is that if we can provide some additional support for the providers, then it sort of helps the whole situation. In the emergency department, though, we really are sort of changing the uh, culture where the emergency department was the place to go and then get admitted we're really sort of becoming the gateway to say, are there alternatives to admission? Can we provide some different models, different care models that will send the patients home? So, you know, they don't have the burden of being an inpatient. They may lose some cognitive sort of components uh, and not be able to get back up to where they were if they come into the hospital as opposed to being cared for at home. And so that's, that's sort of the, the, the dichotomy is, can we actually change that culture and provide alternative models, and there's not one model that will fit for everybody. So we'll need a, a Chinese menu of what model fits best for you. Okay. And in terms of change that culture, you shared a really nice example with me before this panel. Um, and it'd be great if you could share how that interoperability has really 
gave a positive, positive outcome. Um, if you could share it with a right, wider audience, that'd be amazing. Sure, so we had, a, um, you know, as mentioned previously, we um, created interoperability between our pre-hospital uh, ambulance services and our hospitals so that the data flows in real time before the patient actually arrives to the hospital. And we had turned on this uh, system in, in April of oh, last year, oh, oh, two years ago. And so within the first four weeks, um, we had a patient that came in uh, to the hospital, initially seen at the scene, having some chest pain, it was hypotensive, uh, the paramedics did an EKG there, and it showed uh, a myocardial infarction. And they were able to push that information in real time to our facility, and we actually had the cath team, including the cardiologist, down there waiting for the patient for about 10 minutes, and they're like, okay, I can see all the information, where's the patient? So we were actually able to get that patient up to the cath lab within 16 minutes, which is huge. And so uh, he did very well, left the hospital, didn't have any issues, but that sort of response and reaction was, it makes it all worthwhile. Quick clarifying question, you, 16 minutes, what might it have taken before just to frame the perspective of? 90. So showing you the huge importance of data. And here at Worrell, we, we conduct many, many digital solution projects. We look at how that data is shared and, for example, connected auto-injectors. One of the responses we seem to get back a lot from participants is, where the hell is my data going? Who's seeing this data? So how are you managing this? What are the boundaries behind um, who's looking after this data? Is this data safe? So uh, a lot of the healthcare systems now are actually addressing those issues. Um, you know, safe data, encrypted data, you know, the, uh, initially uh, data was encrypted at the database level and then at the transaction level. And so as data comes along, the question is not how encrypted is it or how safe is it, but where is it? And can it follow the patients? It has to go where it needs to go. San Diego's a, a tourist town. We see patients from all over the world, all over the country coming, out, coming to San Diego for vacations. We can care for those patients uh, here in Minneapolis. And so say they come in, ride a scooter, get an accident, and we can get their information from the hospitals here uh, and transparently say, okay, well, we know that you have an allergy to a medication we don't want to give you. And so that, that's the important part is, is really the transparency of the data. And you mentioned, obviously, people traveling across the world, going to San Diego, for example. We've got people in the audience from Shanghai, the Netherlands, and London, um, all sort of different systems. How does the future look for interoperability between globally? So it's, it's on a pathway. Uh, it's not, probably not quite there. Uh, you know, ICD-10 codes, SNOMED codes. We are creating the interoperability framework, um, but there still, has to, there still is growth. And, and as stewards of the data ourselves, as we see patients, it's important that we actually um, create that sort of nomenclature so we can actually uh, treat patients, send them home, and provide the information so that their doctors at home can actually care for them and continue that, that process. Perfect, um, again, thank you. I have one follow-up question. How does the work that you do, I understand the patient implications, which are incredible. What about to clinicians? Epic seems to be the uh, center of a lot of people's um, heartbreak, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> what, <laughs> let's learn yes. about that a bit. Uh, it, it's, it's an iterative process. So yes, you're correct. As, as academic institutions brought, in, and there's many academic institutions that brought Epic in. And so it, it's an iterative process. We brought it in. Uh, there were things we liked, there were things we didn't like, but then we had the opportunity to change it. And so we were, we're actually going through our third generation of our application now. So with each upgrade that Epic does, we sort of customize it ourselves. So we are always trying to optimize it for the providers. Gotcha. I'm sure many are thankful. Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thanks. Dr. Lillingard. Hello. Thank you. Um, something that you forgot to mention in your spiel about yourself earlier was that uh, the surgeries that you perform, you're one of the few surgeons in the world that are willing and, and brave enough to do these. I think it's absolutely commendable and it needs to be said to the audience to paint a clear picture of, of the work that you do. So incredible. And I'm sorry that I called what you said earlier a spiel 
it was a, a lovely presentation. I just, you know, I'm kind of going with what comes to mind. <laughs> Um, so, so on that note, it would be wonderful if perhaps you could share or give the audience an idea of, of what it feels like to be operating on, on a mom and a baby and, and have two lives in your hands at once. I imagine uh, not all of us will have that experience in our lives, so perhaps you could paint a little picture. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's humbling. Um, I mean, I, I think that um, uh, as clinicians, I think we're always aware of the fact that you've um, you've entered into sort of this unique covenant with your patient, and it's based on a lot of trust that your position as a physician garners, and not this like years of relationship that you have with them. Primary care providers are very special in that they can develop that long-term relationship often with their patients, and and so. When you, as a surgeon, uh, interact with a patient, it's usually much like you, maybe it's a brief interaction often. Um, you're there to help them at a time point and then they move on within the system that's pretty complex and you're just a, almost a cog in the wheel. Mm -hmm. But at the time when I interact with them, it's a mom, right? It isn't a patient. She doesn't see herself as a patient. She sees herself as a mom. That's entirely different. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you ask a mom what would you do for your kid, it's anything, right? So you've got this uh, unique responsibility to help her understand that she's also a patient, she's also at risk, she's a part of this whole process because almost every mom that I interact with in this situation um, it tunes that all out, right? All the risk and subsequent pregnancy and what's going to happen, what does she have to do, and everything else. They already came in with the idea that there's hope. My kids got an opportunity. I'd love to. Whatever you got, let's mm -hmm. do it. And and bringing it, uh, bringing it back for them to understand that this that they are a patient um, as well as the baby is is hard um, because you you want them to trust that you're there to take care of their baby and that you're very focused on that. But you also want them to know that you're there to take care of them. So um, I, I think it's I think it's humbling, right? I mean, you're constantly aware of it because. Um, you, you've got mom, we all have moms, you know, and we've um, I've got this real sense of why they're there. You know, they're not selfishly serving anything. They're, they're there all for their kid. So I, I really honestly feel like the best word described is humbling. I don't know if this is a, an inappropriate question, but do you ever get nervous? Always. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, yeah. always. I'm, I'm, a, I'm acutely aware of... Um, the mistakes that I can make, and, and I've made some of them, and you have to be honest and tell the families about it. And the most disheartening thing is to walk into a family's room and tell them that um, an outcome that uh, yeah, occurred that you um, were hoping against and protecting against occurred, and you know, even despite your best efforts or even everything going you know to the best of your ability well, sometimes you still lose. So yeah, I think if. I think if a surgeon is not appropriately aware, I don't know if nervous is the right word, but appropriately aware of what's at risk, even when you do something, quote, routine, um, I, I, I wonder if that's a good place for them to be. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it. Um, switching gears to talk a little bit more uh, about the genetic side of things that you're doing, help maybe paint a picture of, of what the world or what life could look like in maybe 10 years of with uh, the progression of genetic therapies and treatments? So if you look at like the FDA, for instance, in gene therapy, you know, a decade ago, there were a handful, literally a handful of trials for uh, gene therapy open. And now there's over 2,500. It's amazing, 2,500 plus. And it's growing like every day, there's just another one that's approved. And, but there's only four or five approved therapies, CAR-T being the most recent. Um, and you think about that, you've got 2,500, maybe 2,800 now. Last time I looked at it was about a year ago, so it's gotta be a lot more. Um, and you only have four or five approvals. This is gonna explode. And uh, what I think from a healthcare standpoint, um, you go back 50 years or 70 years and you think about the advances we made, being able to do open heart surgery. Now people are living to be 60 and 70. Um, we were able to make these amazing advances, advancements and patients did do better, but we added cost and burden to it. We added complexity to it. And we're at a point in our system where it's just, it's 17%, if, uh, if I get this number right, of our GDP is healthcare. 
there's no more in the bucket. It's, it's tapped dry. We're borrowing actually from this bucket. It's, it's empty. Um, our healthcare solutions need to not only take into account what is good for the patient and what's good for the family, but what's good for the ecosystem. And I think gene therapy has a way to, to address that. I think approaching diseases from a preventative standpoint um, and a curative standpoint um, is a must. The system can't take on any more burden. Uh, and so I think that um, if we're smart about this, gene therapy has a way to offload the, the system and unburden it. Um, and I think that um, it will also have a chance to make it accessible to places like Lima. You know, you can say, you're, you don't, oh, today it might be very expensive to have these therapies, but in the future, quite honestly, um, you know, that work you saw up there was done, you know, the first part of that work was done by a second year graduate student myself for $40,000, you know, and it, you know, the only other iteration that hadn't been published took five and a half years in a Howard Hughes lab and a million and a half dollars. I mean, we are going to get good and efficient about being able to do this, and the delivery is pretty, pretty simple. So I think it has a chance to level the playing field and improve access while unburdening the, the, the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. I mean, thinking about that and playing that tape through to what a future might look like, I imagine that, not if, but when these therapies are successful and, and, and massly adopted, there's gonna be a lot of implications for healthcare. I mean, are many of the specialties, I imagine, will, will no longer be necessary? Or, I mean, what are you seeing for that vision, if, if anything? Yeah. I don't know if I've thought too much about what would become obsolete. And I think that would be great, actually, in some ways, right? Thinking of um, if someone said my job would be obsolete because something much better came along, I would find something else to do. Um, and there's probably other things that you could think about. But, the, but that's a good thing. Can you imagine no one needing surgery or nobody having cancer, nobody having heart disease? That's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. We don't need cardiologists anymore. That's something we talk about in a history book. That's awesome. Um, I'm not sure about the about fields becoming obsolete, maybe changing and evolving. Um, but um, what I do think is that um, uh, in a children's hospital, I get to see this view. One thing that you'll see is uh, molecular medicine may end up being one of the largest departments in a hospital. Uh, and you can consider uh, every medication that we give, every therapy we approach, every disease, uh, for the most part, has a molecular uh, backdrop to it, right? The decision to use one antibiotic or one pain medicine or to um, a approach a patient um, with uh, one chemotherapeutic agent or another, there's a molecular backdrop to all of it. And I think molecular medicine um, will rapidly become one of the most important parts of our healthcare system for the reasons that we just talked about, but also because it's just the way that we're gonna view problems. Um, we're gonna stop seeing problems as a giant tumor, this big thing with your eyes, but we're gonna see a tumor as a molecular disorder that needs to be addressed. Hmm. Wow, crazy. The whole lens that you perceive healthcare and health and treatment through might change. It's, it's uh, hard to even process for me. Um, I'm curious to know what uh, are the ethical concerns with genetic therapies, if any, what that might look like and what your per point of view and perception is there. Uh, you know, it, it, I don't even think this is like a, uh, um, an unreal, unrealistic concern. Um, think about people with pre-existing conditions, right? Mm -hmm. um, when, when is that determined? You've got pre-existing conditions starting when? When did your diabetes start and then change health? And you know, we're having this debate, do we save it, do we keep it? <clears throat> what is the obligation of the patient versus the obligation of the society, the system, getting your immunizations, right? You've got a personal right to not get it, but you also have a social yeah. responsibility to get it. There's a point where it's a give and take. Your rights end at a certain point when other people's rights are infringed, right? I think when you're talking about from a genetic standpoint, um, it's not, you've, I don't know if people have seen the movie Gattaca, right? This is a movie back in the, back in the day, but it's, it's actually kind of interesting. So somebody who chooses, right? You've got all the options of prenatal testing now at eight to 10 weeks. I can uh, get cell-free DNA of baby from mom's blood draw. And if you're looking for it, you can find pretty much any genetic disorder. Mm. It's remarkable, right? It's there right now from a simple blood draw. And you, uh, you could say, well, you chose to have that child. That's a pre, when does that pre-existing condition? Yeah. And then if there was a therapy to treat and cure versus going on to more traditional approaches, to, it's a, becomes a choice. And if a system is so taxed and so burdened at a certain point, 
when do we start to say that was your choice and the repercussions of that are now yours, mm -hmm. right? I worry about that because um, right now we're very humane and I think we're saying, oh, if you've got cancer and you smoke for a number of years, we've got you. Mm -hmm. we'll, well, somehow we'll figure it out. I don't believe that the stress that I see the system being burdened with, you know, and you can see it in the EDs and you can see it uh, in, the, in uh, clinics that used to be just 20 years ago, 15 or 20 patients now are 45 and 50. I just don't believe the stress I see in the system is going to allow for people to have totally autonomous choices. I think that there's going to be um, hard choices that individuals and systems are going to have to make in, to, to address this limited resource that is now, that's is it. We're, I think we're at the precipice. Who do you see maybe driving uh, uh, the taking away of some of those choices? Oh, I mean, I hate to admit it, but money drives everything, yeah, right? I, I really, honestly, um, if you told somebody that um, uh, smoking is bad for their health, and C. Everett Koop um, made it his mission when he became the Surgeon General in 1980 or 1981 to generationally change this idea of smoking. Um, you could, you could um, walk into a restaurant in 1975 and, uh, and and tell a smoker to stop smoking and a non-smoker would shoot you because you're infringing on that smoker's mm -hmm. right. And today, if uh, someone's smoking in a restaurant, a smoker will tell them to stop doing that, right? It's been a generational change. But you could have changed it like that if you had made the cost of cigarettes for everybody, you know, $100 a you know, pack or $100 a cigarette. Um, I, I worry that the decisions will be made financially, and I think the humanity of the decisions um, will ultimately, depending on the stress of the decision, will become less and less important. Thank you. Switching gears a little bit. Um, recently, my, for my birthday, my mom got me 23andMe. This is a, a direct-to-consumer. <laughs> you might have heard of it. A genetics test. It can tell you about your ancestry. It can tell you about your health. And, uh, and it's going through the process of being cooked or shaken or whatever happens in the meantime. Um, and, and it's given me an option to check a box to figure out if I want to find out if I am genetically inclined to having Alzheimer's. And I, I haven't checked it yet. I don't, I don't, I'm asking people what they would do. I'm not really sure. So as we've seen this kind of huge boom in, in direct-to-consumer to genetic testings, I'm curious to know if you've seen any implications to that in your work. And are laymen, are people really equipped to handle that type of information about their own health? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, today genetic testing is a big part of lots of different therapies. I mean, prenatally people are getting uh, genetic tests for looking for massive problems like chromosomal abnormalities, like trisomy 21, Down syndrome, other lethal anomalies that lead them to make care decisions um, even before babies are born. Um, I think that the uh, complexity that you're talking about, about predisposition to, it's the genetics with the epigenetics. That's, the, that's a really complex problem. If you said, listen, you've got the Huntington's disease gene, just simply put, um, you only have to have a single copy. It's an autosomal dominant disorder. You're going to get it. It's guaranteed. That's a, that's a black and white thing. But a lot of the things that we see uh, in medicine are genetics with epigenetics. You've got this environmental component on top of it. And I think that as great as we're going to get, at least today in the next 10 years, about being able to have the genome sequence, have the proteomics and the downstream, you know, uh, protein effect and, you know, the, that molecular level, really understanding what the environment has to do with those final steps to create the outcome that you're trying to guard against, I, I think we're a long ways from understanding that. I mean, you take two people who are genetically identical, right? You know, you take uh, twins, identical twins, truly identical twins, mono-mono twi uh, uh, mono twins, and you say one developed a uh, cancer and the other one didn't. Why? Right? I mean, there's a genetic predisposition and an environmental component. Mm -hmm. Well, the genetic predisposition wasn't enough. So I think it's a very complex interplay that we're probably years away, and it's more the computing power. It's not really the knowledge of those environmental factors or the genetics. I think it's the commuting power. There's so much data over such a huge piece of uh, time and being able to collect effectively all those data points and be able to then to generate an outcome that really gives you, you're going to die at age 30.6 years, like they say in the movie Gattaca. I mean, that's, we're far away from that. So I think getting that information is powerful, but it also may be a burden to you if you're talking about predisposition. 
oftentimes, and this has been said many times, you sort of uh, put yourself on a path to avoid your destiny. You sort of find yourself in that same place and trying to avoid it. So I don't, I don't think you know it unless you uh, um, have a lot more information than we have right now. So Alzheimer's is a little different. It's a very specific problem, but there are a lot of things out there with the predisposition. It's tough to know what to do with that information. I'll let you know what I find out, I guess. <laughs> Thank you for the answer. Um, before we open up to, to questions from all of you, lovely people, uh, just a final question for our panelists. I mean, the Clinical Advisory Board is, is a lot about what we can learn from you, but we're also here to be collaborators and, and to partner with, with all of you. So what, what can we do? What can we do to partner with you, to collaborate, and, and bringing to fruition the future that you're hoping to have in healthcare? With you, Dr. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm already learning from you guys, right? I mentioned sort of some of the things I've learned about human factors and, and user experience and your design earlier when I was sort of getting to tour around. But I think um, Worrell has such a, a broad reach and learning about your international scope of work has been really fascinating. And I think that I'm in this little bubble in Boston. Um, and so for me, it's really sort of learning about what are the lessons that you all are learning in your day-to-day -day jobs that can influence the way that I think about my research or my problems or my patients. Um, I think that's really where learning from your experience is so invaluable for, for researchers. Okay. I think similarly, as, as much as you've had a panel of experts up here today talking about what we do, you all have a lot of expertise that I know absolutely nothing about. Right? I had right, one of my teachers from my MHA class, Service Lines was here today. Like, I know nothing about a lot of this stuff. I spent my whole life learning about medicine. And so giving us that knowledge, helping us to see it in a different light is very helpful to us because we tend to be so tunnel driven mm -hmm. and this is how it is science and you're like, no, look at it this way. And that's where you all have that, that, that unique perspective that can really help us as clinicians see things in a different light and end up improving things overall. Thank you. I think one of the things I've, in my time with uh, Kai and the team here, um, I've seen is that um, uh, we do get a bit tunnel vision, right? And we're a little limited, uh, limited in our ability to communicate effectively the things that we hope to get out to patients or other parts of the care team that need to be supportive of the work that we're doing. Um, I don't think we understand the impact that we have uh, all the time in the ethnographic research and probably understanding the, uh, the people we hope to help uh, better is a huge deal, being able to message and communicate better. Um, that's one of the things that, uh, if I, I'm honest about uh, my many shortcomings, uh, that's, that's one of them. And I think Kai's group here and the Worrell group is uh, excellent at helping me bridge that gap. So um, I think that's something that would uh, be, I mean, you saw the video. I think I, I spoke for way too long and then you watch a three minute video and you're much better prepared to understand what I do. I mean, it's, that, that's hugely helpful. I can take that to patients and I can take it to um, to investors for the companies that we have and you can say this is what we're doing and you take people immediately from here to here very rapidly so I think that's a huge help. Dr. Queen. So I certainly agree with both of them um, you know one of the things that we presented for our, our senior, senior emergency department was the environment and there's a, there's a lot of things that we have tunnel vision on we can do patient care we can do um, data, we can mine data, but the environment um, really is sort of overlooked in hospital systems. And so, you know, engaging with Kai and the team and having them look at the environment is it, you know, how much input does art have? How yeah. much input does light have? How much do, input does just the design and, and construct of the facility have for patients? And so um, I guess it's a validation moment. There's more need that we have for helping us validate what we actually think is correct. Great. Thank you all so much. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.